Welcome to the Landmark Theater's Q&A podcast. In this podcast, we'll hear a discussion with writer-director Victor Levin and stars Berenice Marlowe and Anton Yelchin from the film Five to Seven, moderated by the film's producer, Julie Lin, recorded at the Landmark West L.A. So the question is, first of all, her non-question was that she loved the movie. Thank you very her, much. Her actual question was, how did you come up with the story? Uh, I was uh, in, in the 80s uh, in, in France with my girlfriend at the time. And uh, we stayed at the home of friends of hers who were married and who had this kind of marriage. And it was holiday time, and there were a lot of gatherings. And at a couple of them, the husband was there, and the wife was there, and the boyfriend was there, and the girlfriend was there. And I thought, I, I, what, what is this? I have no <coughs> idea what to make of it. But she said, you know, just keep your eyes open and your mouth shut, and you might learn something. And I saw that they were happy, and they were elegant about it, and there really were strict rules. And it's the kind of thing that you tuck away until you're a little older and smarter and you can figure out the rest of the story. So the question was for the actors, from the time you read the script until the time you performed the roles, did your understanding of the parts evolve? Well, I find it very interesting um, because for me, the, it was, I saw it like an excuse to, to question things, to, 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 to not, you know, be judgmental in, gen in general in life and question uh, question things, uh, have uh, your own opinion and don't listen specifically to what is supposed to be right or or, or wrong. And, and, and so this is why one of the reasons I was attracted to the script. And so when I left the script, I was still convinced that anyone has to do whatever feels right for themselves as long as it's in a respectful manner and every, every, everyone is happy, but you have to be respectful to, to, to yourself in general, in life, not only with, uh, you know, not spe I'm not specifically speaking about that, that topic. Anton, what is your point of view about open marriage? Tell us about everything. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't have like a judgment, do you know what I mean? I just, uh, I tend not to, I think. I think, first of all, you have to be sympathetic to the character that you're going to play. I don't know how you would otherwise connect with them if you weren't sympathetic, regardless of what they're doing. And even if you felt that what they were doing, say, was completely unethical, say they were like some kind of uh, sort of malevolent, vicious murderer or something like that, um, you'd have to still relate to them in some way. So I didn't have a, a judgment at all. Um, uh, I just got excited. I don't know why I got excited when I was had started thinking, and so now I'm, it's harder for me to think. Um, uh, we can come back to you. No, yeah, later. Uh, uh, no, I, I, you know, I, I don't. For me, the hardest part of sort of understanding this character's journey was um, figuring out why he was actually so judgmental at the beginning. Because I would try to be as understanding as I could be, you know, because I couldn't say, I, I think saying something is unethical is a really severe sort of thing to say, you know, and I, I think um, if I were to really probe what I believe, there only would be a short list of things I'd call unethical and sort of someone that uh, clearly is just exuding so much affection and has told you that it's a, it's a worked out thing, you know, that they're both having a great time. It's a party all around. I wouldn't be like, uh, no, this is horrible. You know, I'd probably give it a little more, uh, I'd just be more open to it. Um, yeah. The question is, to what extent did you want to lean into the traditional oeuvre of the New York filmmakers like Woody Allen? How much did you want to lean in? How much did you want to diverge from that? Um, well, first of all, I mean, I, I, I love his work, uh, but... Um, I wanted to lean against it, if I may borrow your phraseology, because I, I, you know, I didn't want our movie to be like anybody else's movie. I wanted it to be our movie. And, uh, but it's very difficult to attempt to make a romantic story that takes place in New York without reminding people of him, because he's made 75 great ones, you know? Uh, so so it, that's a blessing and a curse. I mean, it's... You're always going to be in, in, you know, if you're lucky, 
you know, listed somewhere distantly down the category that he's at the top of. There's nothing you can do about that. But I, I was thinking much more about Lena Vertmuller and, and Bill Forsyth and Whit Stillman, who made the movie Metropolitan that I, that I love, and Truffaut, of course, and De Sica and, and uh, Visconti and guys like that. You know, it, but it's impossible not to. It's impossible not to remind people of Woody Allen when you leave the camera alone and you, and you have uh, people saying things that are hopefully, you know, amusing. Sometimes that's that's uh, that's going to happen. It's it's an occupational hazard. Um, well, you know, but uh, but I was leaning against. Vic, people might find it interesting to hear about the X scenes and how you created that and how you used New York for those. Well, we have, as you know, because you've heard them speak, two incredibly witty actors. And there were days where it rained and we couldn't shoot what we were supposed to shoot. So we would kind of give them a suggestion and let them run with it. And one of them is the Passover joke. We had no idea the film was going to be released on Passover. That was just a rare Passover release. Uh, which, uh, which you know, up till this point was something that my Uncle Nudie excused himself and did in the other room after the Seder. <laughs> Different meaning now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, uh, that day we, had, we were going to shoot more of the baseball scene, which you might have noticed was uh, mostly in wide shots. That's because the close <laughs> shots got rained out. And uh, we, uh, we kind of just set Berenice and Anton loose with umbrellas and and tried some some topics, and they were just they were wonderful with it. So those that became the sort of um, template for these things, which we called X scenes. Whenever we had a little extra time, crossing Park Avenue, uh, ra rolling them up in the sheets, marching them out to the balcony uh, on Fifth Avenue, which you're not strictly speaking supposed to do, but you know nobody got mad. And uh, and we didn't know where they would go in the movie, but we we found places for most of them, not all of them. And you can't do that unless you have people who you hand them a premise and they turn it into beautiful dialogue and you know they, they just have such fast minds and they had so much fun with it so there were probably four or five scenes in the movie like that. Did you all enjoy those little unscripted X pieces? In turn, <laughs> what did, you, did you enjoy the non-scripted? Uh, <laughs> I don't speak English actually so I try to. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Did. That's that's do I am I answering your question? <laughs> all of a sudden, you don't speak English? When did that yeah. happen? <laughs> He's still excited from before. I know. I'm excited about the Uncle Nudie joke. I'm oh, still laughing sure. about that. I really like that sure. one. <laughs> and I'm going to cherish that for a while. Um, yeah, I did like them. I mean, I think those are hard because when you have a script that's as uh, el that's written as eloquently and and as well written as this script was, with such a particular voice and tone for each character, and if you are, aren't as al articulate, <laughs> there you go, there's an example, uh, aren't as articulate as the character, and you don't speak that way, and as literate as the character is, it's, it's, you can't suddenly, just because you're improvising, snap out of who this person is, so you have to sort of continue the tone without having the, I guess, the tools to do that. So for me personally, it was challenging, kind of scary, because I thought, suddenly Brian's gonna sound like a kid from the San Fernando Valley, and not Brian. Uh, um, it worked out fine, I think, but uh, that was sort of, you know, that was scary to me. Uh, so th the question is that while he enjoyed very much the compositional style of the film and the static, the static frame, uh, it does tie you to long one shots and limit you in the editorial room and whether that came back to bite you, I believe, was the, the question. Yes. That, you know, that's what we could have. We could have shot. We had plenty of time to shoot it any way we wanted to. Uh, thanks to Julie and her producing partner Bonnie Curtis. Uh, but that was the, the way I wanted it to look. I, I believe that my job is to create a nice window for, into a story that you can watch. I think you're smart. I think you know where to look. I don't think I have to remind you that you're watching a movie, which is what I do every time I cut when I don't have to cut. Um, and our our cinematographer Arno Podier is a master at creating what I think are, are painterly frames that use the verticals very well and frames within frames and where the colors are exquisite. And I, I didn't want to disturb that. You know, I, I want to be as invisible as possible. I just want, I want the actors, the wonderful actors, and the words and the actions to do their work. So, th so we, we meant to do it. That was the goal. 
but yeah, I mean, you, you're there's going to be a recumbent bicyclist driving through your shot. There are legions of birds. You're you're certainly leaving yourself open, but I think it's worth it. I, I will tell you that of all the movies I've produced, this one has come by far the closest to utilizing every single setup that we shot in the final edit of the film. It's not even close, which just goes to the kind of preparation that Vic and Arnaud did. The question was, was there any, was there rehearsal for the actors before shooting started? You guys want to take that? We went in uh, Central Park just uh, to know, to get to know each other and speak about the story a bit and basically just, you know, uh, eating hot dogs and cheeseburgers so that we, <laughs> we create a, a food alchemy, which for me is, is very important. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Once yeah, my, my, my stomach is empty, I'm, I'm, I'm in love. So <laughs> but specific rehearsals, no, we, we, we didn't Bet between the two of us. Yeah, we did, the three of us, we did have a couple of days to sort of run things down. You know, the rhythm and the cadence are so important, the pace. That's not the kind of thing you want to be working out on the day you shoot because there isn't time, you know. So, uh, but, th but these guys were on it from the from the very beginning. I mean, I've never seen two better prepared actors. And let's, you know, consider that Berenice is working in what is arguably her third language, because her Spanish is unbelievable. And, uh, you know, and getting complicated sentences thrown at her and, and vocabulary, and she just, she just uh, mastered it, and, and it was, it was uh, beautiful. You know, that's homework. So there's rehearsal that you do all together, and then there's the sheer, the stuff you never see, is the actor doing homework, uh, and you're endlessly grateful for it. The question is, is on-screen chemistry something that you either have or you don't have, or is it something that you can work at and develop? And I will tell you that Bonnie, my producing partner, and I were so... One, we were nervous on day one. You know, how is it going to be? These guys are really different. And after the, the first bit of the, f <laughs> and, and we just looked at each other after that first thing, we're like, oh my God, they really, they brought it. They can, and they just committed to it 800%. It was a great lesson in actor commitment and we were, we were gobsmacked by it. But you guys talk about that. Talk about how you came to that. Anton, you can talk about her hands. We always talk about Berenice's hands, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, uh, to be honest, um, I think that it's credit to Berenice for being, for having beautiful hands, that's all I have to say. No, no, uh, I think, um, you know, to be, when you meet someone that is so genuine and, uh, and so kind and warm with you, it's instantly disarming, um, especially I feel like when you're going into something like this, it's bound to be intimidating with someone as stunning as Berenice. And I think, um, when you when you're disarmed in that way, you feel like all right, I can sort of uh, do whatever. You know what I mean? The 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 channel is open for uh, discussion, experimentation, and ideas and emotions to go back and forth, and there's not going to be any judgment and any fear. And then I think that helps. I do like to think though that it doesn't matter really. I mean, I feel like people can do their jobs; they can hate each other and still have pretty good chemistry. I don't know, um, because then otherwise, like every movie has to be like what the movie is. I just don't believe that. I think that you can have, I think maybe that would be a great experiment just to cast people that have no chemistry <laughs> as opposed to looking for chemistry and see what happens. Maybe not from a producerial standpoint, but from an experimental <laughs> standpoint, you know? Might be exciting. I'm so interested to hear another producer's experience of that. <laughs> Berenice? Um, for me, it's both. Um, I, I've seen love stories when you don't see any chemistry and it's it's too bad because it's so important to to love story and so what it what is very important to me is when you get along so much with uh, your acting partner which was the case with Anton it's so important to me because then this is why I love movies the, the magic stays it's in the molecules it's in the invisible what what a connection you cannot really recreate, you, you will see it on screen. And then um, for specific scenes or type of dialogue, you do what, what we do for any, any genres, uh, comedy or comedies or dramas, you, you 
you find specific things in your life or personal life that are going to bring you the specific emotional looks or um, uh, so that you're cooked for the for the for the um, the demands of, of a specific scene and and when you so so Anton is such a, an amazing actor and we had a, a, an amazing complicity so that was that that was great because um I, I, I think we we saw the chemistry uh, chemistry on, on, on screen and, and, and yeah so it's both. I hate to do this, but can we theorize for one second on the alt film in which there is no chemistry between the two main characters? <laughs> the parents follow Brian till the end, and the check is cashed, or is that too much? I, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, I can't let it go. I'm sorry. Gonna, I'm flogging a dead horse gonna, here. There's going to need be a little work. Work going to be but, involved. But yeah. it's possible, right? Yeah, absolutely. No. Nope. I'll be hiding in the trailer I didn't have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's someone very excited to ask a question up there. A lady. Thank you. Well, all those people I mentioned, thank you very much, by the way, for, for such lovely words. Uh, the question is, is what led you to the beautiful, rom as funny as the movie is, what led you to the heart of it being so romantic? Uh, you know, all those, all those directors that I mentioned before were very romantic directors, in my opinion. I mean, Lena Vertmuller, the original, swept away. Certainly several Woody Allen movies, extremely romantic. I, Wood Stillman, romantic in his way, you know. Um, Garden of the Finzi Cantini is very romantic in its way. So uh, I guess it's just how I am. It's a, I guess it's just how I see the world. Uh, I guess that's why I love those movies, and I'm sure they were all swirling around in my head um, when I wrote this one. But but it really is the way I see the world. I mean, it's either the way I s think it is or the way I wish it were. I can't tell. Uh, it's one of the two, and uh, and it makes its way onto the page, I guess. The question is that there was quite a bit left to one's imagination in the way that some of the scenes between the two of them were staged. And was it planned that way, or did it evolve in the execution of the film? Thank you for asking that. I'm really glad you did. I, it was planned that way. It says things in the script like we remain politely in the hall or, you know, whatever. I, I, would, I would like the world to be polite. You know, I, I, I would, I, would I, I would like it to be a place where, you know, we don't have to see everything and we can kind of put two and two together and, you know, we can use a light touch and a little subtlety and nuance. I mean, you knew what was going on. And so I, I think there's a time to leave your, for the camera to leave your subject alone and, and a time for, for the audience to be given some credit for being able to connect the dots and, and you know, to resist the modern day urge in movies to show everything under the guise of it being, I don't know what, cinematic, I think is the word they use, and I don't understand what that means in that context. Everybody just <coughs> behave yourself for a second. Thank you all so much. Thank you very for much.